Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, I hope you're all uh, well and staying safe. Uh, first of all, congratulations. Hopefully, uh, <clears throat> all of you managed to successfully uh, submit the 10th and final uh, deliverable last night. Uh, congratulations. Um, it says I'm having a bad connection. Can everybody hear me okay? See me and hear me okay? See the slides? Can someone type into chat if you can hear me okay? Yes, okay, thank you, Khan. Okay, so uh, again, congratulations on finishing uh, the 10th and final uh, deliverable. So between now and uh, Tuesday, December the 8th, uh, you're gonna be working on your final project. You now have basically the base layer for teaching uh, someone uh, the first 10 digits of the ASL uh, in ASL. It is up to you how to take that system now and turn it into, uh, to, to gamify it or to add some functionality to make the system engaging for someone to use. We talked about educational software, how sometimes it can be a bit of a slog. Um, can you exploit all you've learned about HCI so far to turn it into an engaging system that draws the user in uh, and uh, makes the learning of ASL a more enjoyable experience? So, uh, in order to implement your final project between now and December 8th, you're going to be submitting again every Monday night uh, another uh, one, or, one or two videos. But these are going to be uh, sort of videos demonstrating your own ideas about functionality and how you've implemented them so far. So we're gonna spend the first few minutes uh, this morning talking about the final project in general and the first of the uh, interim videos that you'll be submitting. So if you click on that link, it will take you to a document that describes uh, everything about the final project. So we'll talk mostly about the interim videos today and I'll just briefly mention uh, what you're submitting or what you're presenting during our exam period on December the 8th. Okay, as I just mentioned, you're going to be adding in some new functionality uh, of your own. It's up to you to decide what new functionality you want, but it should be non-trivial. What does non-trivial mean? Well, what, what is reasonable in the remaining uh, two or three weeks that we have uh, before the exam period? In order to give you an idea about what we're looking for, I've given uh, four examples here. Um, of projects that students have done in the past. You're free to choose one of these and do uh, something very much like it or something, again, of your own uh, choosing. Uh, you might, for example, enable your users to learn ASL letters uh, in addition to digits. Uh, in order to do so, you'd have to go back to uh, record, uh, record gestures uh, record those letters, add them to your training set, retrain your KNN learner against all the digits plus the additional letters, and then test your learner to make sure it's working. Uh, you could also expand your KNN learner to record uh, an ASL gesture that changes over time. For example, the letter J is signed as follows, which requires, as you can imagine, multiple frames of data. One of the reasons why uh, we focused on just the 10 ASL digits of, is of course because they are static digits and they can be recognized by the KNN using a single frame of data. Some of the letters and the more complex uh, gestures in ASL uh, are things that change over time. If you tackle this, uh, I would suggest coming to see me during office hours. There are some non-trivial changes you need to make to your KNN learner. As you may remember, when you trained your KNN, you were training it on a 4D tensor. You had a series of 3D tensors, a sequence of cubes, where each cube was capturing one frame of data. If you go to dynamic gestures, you're going to have to go to a 5D tensor. You're going to have to have for a single gesture like J, a series of cubes that capture the positions of the bones in the hand at each moment in time during the gesture. And of course, you're going to have to capture multiple J's to make sure that your KNN is robust to different hands and different positions of signing, different curvatures of the letter J, and so on. This is doable, um, but uh, as you can imagine, a little bit uh, ambitious. So um, come and see me if you want to tackle something like this. 
You could also expand your system by trying to teach the user something other than uh, ASL. So for example, maybe we assume that your users are young, uh, young people and they're learning math at the same time. So maybe you first of all teach them to sign uh, the digits and then you might flash up an equation like three plus four and they need to sign seven as an answer. If they sign that correctly, maybe you start to introduce the idea of variables where they signal that they understood this little mini lesson by signing uh, the answer to B and so on. Yeah, okay. Or you could try and gamify your system in some other way, lots of different ways you could, you could do that. Uh, again, it doesn't have to be any of these four. You could choose something of your own, but these give you a sense of sort of the level of um, the amount of functionality we're looking for uh, in the final project. Okay, um, for the graduate students in the class, I just wanted to point this out. Uh, what we did in past years is graduate students had to test uh, their system. They had to do some user testing with 10 other people. But of course, given the current situation and an effort to support social distancing, we're gonna do no user testing. So instead, uh, the graduate students are gonna be adding in some additional functionality between now and the exam period, which is to allow the user to navigate the system with their second hand. So while they are practicing the ASL digits, um, the user can bring in their uh, secondary hand and say, stop, stop, stop. Let me work on uh, let me work on the number two for a while. Or okay, I'm ready to go on. Challenge me, make things more difficult. Stop here. I want to work on the number three for a while, uh, and so on. Doesn't have to be doesn't have to be that. You can you can think of lots of additional functionality or navigation that the user may be able to uh, that the user may be able to use with their secondary hand. Okay. Okay, so let's talk about the interim videos. Uh, you're going to be submitting three interim videos uh, to Blackboard. One is due Monday, November the 23rd. The next one is due Monday, uh, November the 30th. And then the third and final one is due Monday night, uh, Monday night, December uh, 7, the night before the exam period. So these three interim uh, videos will take you right up to the final exam period. Okay. Interim video one, this is a chance for those of you that missed uh, one or more uh, deliverables or, or weren't happy with one of the grades on your deliverables to make up uh, some, some points here. So whatever score you get for your video one, which is uh, worth five points, it will replace your worst deliverable. So if your worst deliverable, you got two out of five and you get four out of five for the inter interim video, your worst deliverable will now be four out of five. Okay. What are you doing in interim video one? You are demonstrating to us in video form what your uh, functionality is. So we should be able to hear your voice in this case. So you're gonna narrate over the video. You're gonna tell us over about a one minute period. You don't need to make a very long video here. You can just summarize what your new functionality is. While you're giving a one minute summary of your, uh, the functionality and what you plan to do, you, can, you will also be shooting video of your screen and we should be able to see in that video the beginnings of that new functionality. So for example, if you choose to do, uh, do the math with equations and then variables, you might show us that you're now flashing up, uh, you're now flashing up uh, equations after the user successfully signs individual digits, for example. You don't need to show that the user is actually successfully answering these equations yet, just the beginnings of that functionality. Okay, remember the grad students are adding in uh, secondary hand navigation, so the grad students will also be including with their Blackboard submission a storyboard or a series of sketches documenting your proposed secondary hand navigation strategy. Is the user uh, stopping and then allowing forward progress in the system, or is the user clicking buttons with their secondary hand? Uh, just, just sketches, no need to implement that functionality yet. That is due uh, for uh, undergraduates and graduate students, every, that, that is due next Monday at 11.59 p.m. as usual. Any questions about uh, final projects so far? Make sense? Okay.
Not hearing any dissent, let's carry on. So the following week, uh, interim video two, uh, this would normally be you, you submitting a video showing additional, uh, uh, showing additional, uh, doing some user testing with the beginnings of your functionality. So traditionally at this point, we would ask students to document user testing with a dorm mate, friend or family member, whoever is nearby, but again, in order to support social distancing, we will not be doing that. So in interim video two, you're gonna be uh, adding some stuff to the lower left panel, which I believe you have not used yet. In the lower left panel, you're gonna be showing the user a visualization of how their performance during the current session differs from their performance during their last session from the system. So uh, you're gonna be adding a little bit of uh, visualization showing the user how they're uh, progressing. Okay, within the same panel, you'll then show how the user's performance over all their sessions, uh, over all their sessions compares to the performances of the other users who have used your system. Okay, so a user would probably like to see the rate at which they're learning ASL and how their rate of learning compares to those of others. Of course, because of the pandemic, you're not doing any user testing with any other users. So you will act as multiple users. You will sign in with user name one, do some work, sign in with user two, do some more work in the system, sign back in as user one, do some more progress, sign back in as user two, do some more progress. In the bottom left, we should see a running comparison between the learning progress of user one and user two. Okay. Okay, uh, in video, uh, interim video three, you'll again submit, we'll go back to your functionality and you'll be submitting a one minute video demonstrating another increment of functionality added to your system. So this should take you up to uh, mostly implementing your, uh, your system. And uh, the grad students, you will be showing two different functions triggered by two different secondary hand actions. So how, however it is that uh, your user is able to uh, influence navigation in the system with the secondary hand, you'll show two of those gestures. So uh, stop, go forward, or click button one, click button two, whatever it is you decide to do with the secondary hand. Okay, that's due in Blackboard the night before uh, the exam period. Okay, um, I think we will leave the discussion about what you're doing in the exam period uh, for later, but I do want to remind you that you all have the physical leap motion device. <laughs> Normally you would come to class during the exam period and drop off the box. Obviously we can't uh, do that. So there's instructions here that I will give you about how to uh, mail the box uh, back to us. Okay. Any questions about the final project, at least as much as I've described to you? We'll talk about the oral presentation and the written report uh, 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 next week. All good? Okay, so uh, back to lecture then. Uh, we are making our way through uh, a three-part lecture, sorry, a four-part lecture uh, on robotics. And just as a reminder, why are we talking about robotics and HCI? Because robots, like humans, push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. They are interacting with the world. Um, we are gonna move on today and talk about uh, robots interacting with people. So how do we create social robots where they're engaging in a social interaction, not just a physical interaction with the, with the environment. And then uh, probably next week, we'll move on to talking about robots interacting as a group. Okay, before we get there, however, we were talking about situated and embodied cognition last time, so that's where we'll uh, pick up. Just as a very quick reminder, uh, embodied cognition is, kind of, is a simple idea that your physical body is a tool with which you can push against the world. And if you are situated, you have sensors and you can observe the sensory repercussions of those actions. A complete agent is a short form I'm gonna use for the rest of this course, which is any kind of agent that is both embodied and situated. Uh, as we saw last time, embodied agents have interesting properties that if we design uh, to, uh, in such, uh, uh, if we design technological complete agents, robots, in the right way, they can exploit those properties 
to do what we would want them to do. We looked at uh, how, one example of a complete agent that exploits its body and the fact that it can sense the repercussions of its actions last time, BabyBot, which made, uh, for BabyBot, it made uh, image segmentation, recognizing objects in the foreground or segmenting from the background, makes uh, that task much easier compared to a non-complete agent, like a neural network, that does not have a body and does not have sensors and has to learn how to segment objects away from the background using millions of photographs. We as children, as babies, that's the name baby bot, we push against the world literally and observe how the world uh, pushes back. We finished with BabyBot last time and we saw that uh, BabyBot can not only learn to segment objects in its world, if its hand comes into contact with an apple, suddenly there is an apple-shaped blob that starts to move, but BabyBot can learn a lot of other things about the world. What were some of those things that BabyBot was starting to learn about the world that we discussed last time? Go ahead and, and type, uh, type, type into chat what you remember about what BabyBot is able to learn by pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back. Just to help you remember our discussion about BabyBot, BabyBot's hand would move into its field of view and then suddenly there would be a, an apple-shaped blob. BabyBot decides this is something called round. Things that are round are different from self, blobs of motion that occur when BabyBot sends commands to its motion. How, how do round things differ from self things like its hand from baby bot's point of view. Remember that baby bot can only see, can't see colors. It can only see uh, blobs of motion, things that are in motion and everything else that is not in motion. The grayed out areas of its field of view are meant to represent lack of motion. No? Well, BabyBot comes into contact with, with uh, the Apple and BabyBot stops sending commands to its motors. Its hand will stop, which means its hand disappears from its field of view, but a round thing will continue rolling. So round things have the property that they keep the same shape, but they have a change in position even when BabyBot, even when BabyBot is not moving. That's what round means to BabyBot. Okay, I think we'll leave, leave that there and carry on. So uh, again, this idea of complete agents that are both embodied uh, and situated. Um, we often think of complete agents as having a particular form of cognition, a particular way of thinking, which is distributed cognition. Usually when you think about cognition or thinking, for most of us, it's something that is internal, right? Once we receive sensory information from the outside world, we think about it, we combine it with our memories, our goals, our intentions, and then our plans to act and then action. But if you think about BabyBot, that its thinking or its ability to learn about the world is definitely not, not limited to the circuitry that's going on inside its head. Its thinking is very much tied up with the way it's interacting with the environment. So distributed cognition, this uh, adjective here is meant to remind us that cognition is something that is distributed over not just the internal brain of a human or animal or the controller of a robot, it's distributed, it's wider, it captures both the body uh, and its sensation and its action, and it can even uh, expand to contain other agents. Imagine agent one here, which acts on the world and its actions become sensation, its actions are observed or felt by agent two. Agent two takes its sensation and transforms them into actuation or movement or behavior. And, why, and agent one observes agent two in turn. 
based on how agent two acts in response to what agent two senses, agent one who's observing that may build up a mental model of how agent two transforms its sensation into action. So the cognition, the social cognition of agent one in this case, where it's observing other agents in its environment, its cognition is distributed over not just its own body and what happened in response to its own motion, but what other agents do in reaction to their sensation. Okay. All right, uh, so this brings us back to affordances, which we've talked about a few times now, just as a reminder. An affordance is an advertisement that an object or a thing or even a person out in the world projects, right? So uh, door handles are often a good example, uh, used as an exemplary case of affordances. Hopefully for most people, uh, this advertises to turn uh, and pull, and hopefully these bars advertise grasp and push, but of course, for some of us, sometimes that's not always, um, that's, we don't always interpret the affordance correctly. So now that we've thought a little bit about how, age, uh, how robots learn about their world by pushing against the world and observing how the world pushes back, we can get a sense of where human affordances come from. When you look at the objects, any of the objects sitting on your desk or in your room, they immediately, uh, conjure up in your mind ways you might interact with them, right? If you see a book, the uh, hand part of your motor strip will often light up, meaning you're thinking about reaching out to grab that book. A book is something that can be grabbed, and maybe you visualize yourself opening the book and reading uh, the book. And then if you look at a glass, that suggests grasping and so on. So where do these affordances come from? They come from years and years and years of practice uh, of you as a small child learning to interact with objects uh, in the world. As we physically manipulate objects, we are also looking at them. So later on, we can understand how to interact an object just by uh, interact with an object just by looking at them. So this idea of interaction uh, gives us a hint as to where affordances come from for humans. That's important again for us as HCI designers. If we're creating interactive technology in which we want the we want to design technologies that project correct uh, affordances. An interesting uh, way to think about affordances is looking at modern uh, computer games. So if you enter a virtual world like the uh, the virtual world of the popular game Fortnite, there's a, a rich environment of objects and other people and then characters and and so on. An important part about uh, thinking about affordances in virtual worlds is a reminder to us that just because an agent has a body, just because an agent is embodied, does not mean it has to be physical. Remember that a body means something with which you can push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. But no one said that world has to be a physical world. So uh, an avatar is a projection of you in some way, and that avatar has abilities in a given game or a virtual uh, environment. That avatar has various abilities to push against the world or manipulate the, phys the, the virtual world that it exists in. And the avatar has the ability to sense the repercussions of that action. So this is a very important concept for game designers. Um, uh, there's an interesting story that comes from the early development of Fortnite. So in early versions uh, of Fortnite, uh, you could pick up various tools. And in Fortnite, like uh, Minecraft, the primary tool is a pickaxe, which you use to hit various objects and harvest, uh, and harvest objects in the world. Um, so that's, and everything else is meant, uh, sorry, the pickaxe is meant to be something to, that harvests objects from the world. Every other tool you can pick up or find in Fortnite is meant to be a weapon. Uh, however, the axe, which was meant to be a weapon, an axe, when you see it, and I apologize for the poor quality of this image, you can't see it here, but this virtual uh, player, uh, this avatar here is holding uh, an axe. An axe suggests chopping trees. That's the primary affordance for most people when they see an axe. So in early versions of Fortnite, people were using an axe to try and chop down trees, which either was inefficient or didn't work in early versions uh, of, uh, didn't work in early versions of 
uh, Fortnite. So this is known in, in HCI design as projecting a false affordance. The axe suggests cutting down trees, but you're supposed to use a pickaxe to cut down trees in Fortnite. Again, a detail, but that happens very often in uh, when you were creating rich virtual environments. Here's a here's a screenshot from a, a more recent game. I forget, I think this is Doom or Quake or one of one of those games. What are some of the objects in here? I don't know if any of you are familiar with this game, regardless of whether you are or not. Given the way that this scene is rendered, which objects here do you think are manipulatable and which are not? Which ones can be picked up? Which ones can be used as a weapon? Which ones could be stored in the backpack of the avatar? And what are, and uh, Joseph said, sorry, Joseph asked the question, where do people get in affordance with pickaxes? How many people have used a pickaxe. That's exactly the point. It doesn't seem to make sense to use a pickaxe to to uh, to hit a tree. It makes much more sense to use an axe. So the very tools and weapons that were available in early versions of Fortnite were confu were confused uh, were confusing to the users. Uh, how many people have actually used a pickaxe? Exactly, right? Pickaxe, from the shape at least, suggests cutting or digging into, into the soil, again, for, for most people, even if you've never used a pickaxe. But it definitely, uh, the shape of a pickaxe does not suggest that it should be used for cutting down a tree. Most people who see a hand axe, that usually suggests cutting down trees. If you have a hand axe and you see a tree nearby, most characters in the early versions uh, a Fortnite would immediately go over and start trying to chop down the tree with with an axe. Okay, so what are the various affordances projected by the objects in this scene? And which of those do you think are true and which are false? Meaning you can actually engage or generate that interaction with that with that object. If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. You probably cannot climb up that ladder. Now I'm looking for a ladder in this, in this scene. The crates are probably destroyable. Yeah, that's a common, common theme in, in video games, yeah. You'll notice this fine metal mesh here, which could suggest that you could reach up and thread your fingers into the holes and, and swing along uh, the ceiling here. But that would require an avatar that has very fine detail in the hands, which is usually not true in most first person shooters. So although the uh, one affordance that may be projected by this metal mesh is that you can reach up and grab it and pull yourself up to the ceiling, you can interact with the door at the back. So there's a, yeah, the door at the back here, it's got lights on it. You know, lit up lights usually mean the door is active or is listening to you. There's something you can do to probably open that, uh, do uh, that door. Matthew says you probably can't use the pallet jack here in the middle of the room. Matthew, what makes you think you can't use it? You'll notice that it's away from the side of the room and it's standing in, in the middle of the path that the player might take towards the door. Another trick in computer games is to put uh, objects with which you can uh, manipulate, to put them sort of in your path, right? Things that are pushed off to the side are usually meant to be just scenery. Uh, Isaac says the bright and contrasting symbols and textures on the crates uh, are probably there to imply the player that they could be interacted with, right? So exactly, it looks like there's some weird writing that's lit up on the side of the crate. That, that, that sort of additional detail is trying to signal or project the affordance that this box is readable, openable, that it's valuable somehow. There might be something valuable uh, inside. Okay. Okay. All right. So uh, just to, uh, Isaac says, uh, being able to move the pallet jack wouldn't contribute anything to the overall gameplay experience. And from a developmental perspective, from a development perspective, it might be a waste of time to program in the movement. Perhaps, right? 
what what do you do with a pallet jack? You pick up uh, pallets or, or boxes. Maybe that doesn't really make sense if this is a running around, killing people type of game. Hard to say. Ah, there's the ladder. Okay. Okay, so let's take a step back now. Uh, in lecture 21 here, we were t uh, talking about situated... Uh, situated and embodied cognition. And just to make sure you can distinguish the differences between these ideas, I want us to think about four different kinds of technology and, and put them in these boxes. So can you think of some examples of uh, interactive uh, technologies that are both non-embodied and non-situated? We just talked about several examples of kinds of agents that are both embodied and situated. Let's start with non-embodied and non-situated. What are some examples of technologies that lack a body and lack sensors to directly sense the world around them? If you can think of any such technologies, just go ahead and type them directly into chat. Non-embodied and non-situated. Remember that most technologies, they have, a physical, they have a physical presence, right? Your desktop and your laptop and your smartphone and the Leap device, they all, have a, they all have a physical housing that has mass and weight and volume. But only some of those technologies can use their body to push against the world, to, to directly influence the world. What are some examples of non-embodied and non-situated interactive technologies? We mentioned a few at the beginning of this lecture. So we talked about laptops and desktops, which again, don't have a direct way to influence the environment. They can project images onto the screen or they can project audio through uh, the speakers, but they can't have a direct influence on the, the environment. Okay, let's, uh, let's switch and talk about situated and embodied technologies. What are some examples of both situated and embodied technologies, complete agents? We've talked about a few. There are some others that we didn't talk about that you could think of. What goes in this box here? We just talked about avatars, baby bot, exactly. So an autonomous robot, it has a body, it can influence the fruit in front of it and observe the sensory repercussions of it. So any autonomous robot that has sensors is both embodied and situated. If you have a Roomba at home, that would be another example of a situated and embodied interactive technology. As we just discussed, complete agents don't have to be physical agents, so avatars Avatars have a body with which they can push against the world and push back. In a first-person shooter, it's assumed that there is a body, but often it's not seen. So you could argue that that's not really an embodied, uh, an embodied agent. We are interactive systems, not interactive technological systems, at least not yet. We push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. So humans and animals go uh, in this box down here. What about situated but non-embodied uh, systems? What are some example technologies that are situated but not embodied? They can directly sense the world, register changes in the world, but they don't have the ability to use their physical housing to have a direct influence on the environment. What would go in this box down here? Exactly, a sensor itself. So the, uh, the intelligent light sensors uh, in, uh, in the Davis Center, they sense whether there's movement in the, in the room. They're 
You could argue that the intelligent light sensors in the Davis Center are minimally embodied because they can have some influence on the environment. They can turn the lights on in the room. In this discussion, we've been assuming that situatedness or embodiedness is a binary property. Either something is embodied or it isn't. But in reality, there is a gradient between more and less embodiment and more or less situatedness. Okay. This is usually the most difficult box here. Uh, so David Matthews says, uh, weather stations, satellite imagery, exactly. Anything that's, that's co co uh, collecting real-time data from the world directly, but not doing much with that data is a situated but non-embodied technology. What are examples of embodied but non-situated technologies? Technologies that have bodies and they can have important and direct uh, impact on the world, but they have limited or no ability to sense the repercussions of those actions. So David's suggesting a light switch is embodied but non-situated. Okay, a merry-go-round, as Isaac says, right? So any mechanical, any mostly mechanical wind-up uh, system that sort of just does its thing, that would be an embodied and non-situated system. Yeah, a merry-go-round is a great example. Vending machine, same thing. Vending machine is, you know, minimally situated. It's got to be able to sense the money coming in, uh, but it's not really sensing things in, in real time. So yeah, I think vending machine is a good example. I think I gave you another example on last Thursday's quiz. Right. The first generation of industrial robots uh, in a factory, the robot arms that would weigh, weld or, or manipulate, uh, add something to a car in a car factory. Those initial uh, industrial robots had little to no sensors on them. The robot assumed that there was a conveyor belt or some other machine that would bring the car door into exactly the right position for the welding arm to come out and do uh, its thing. So the robot did not need to sense the world around it. So first generation industrial robots, uh, escalators, exactly. You, you get the idea. Okay, so most traditional computers, laptops, and desktops uh, sit in this in this category uh, up here. Any embedded devices, they're embedded in the world, they sense the world directly. Industrial robots, mechanical devices uh, are up here, embodied and non-situated. And people and animals and avatars and autonomous uh, robots or self-moving robots are down here. Okay. Okay, so uh, let's let's play around with this idea. I want you to uh, imagine that you're uh, a game designer for next generation uh, video games that have much richer physics. So assume that you're a developer for Minecraft or World of Warcraft or whatever comes next. But these virtual worlds offer much richer physics. They they enable not just particle simulation, such as hailstorms or snow or boulder fields, but they allow the avatars that are moving around in that virtual environment to interact with that particle simulation. So the particle simulation is not just an animation that's added on top to make the game more visually appealing. They are things, they are physics or physical phenomenon that the avatar can interact with. Imagine that you add in much more complex uh, aerodynamics and hydrodynamics, so wind and water flow. Again, there are a lot of games that, ha that, uh, that give the illusion that there is wind or weather or water flow, but usually the avatar can't really influence or can't interact one-on-one -on -one with, uh, with those phenomena. Imagine it becomes easier to simulate deformable objects. Uh, this is something we work on in my lab, and actually David, who's here this morning, has helped out quite a bit with creating physics engines that do a much better job at simulating uh, deformable objects. So imagine you could have soft materials, rubber, springs, earth, soil, things that are deformable and malleable uh, in, your, in your virtual world. Assuming you had this at hand as the developer, what kind of objects would you place into the virtual world or what kind of scenes would you create and how would you create them so that they project correct affordances? 
they suggest or they advertise to users who enter the game in avatar form how they can interact with those uh, with those phenomena. So again, that there's something that can be interacted with, not just uh, background scenery. You might have to think about how to improve the interaction capabilities of the avatar in, a, in order to better exploit those objects. So going back to this example here with the metal mesh, imagine that the avatar's hands, when the hand comes into the field of view of the human player, could see that there were fingers and those fingers were individually movable. Maybe you connect the Leap Motion device with this next generation game, and if people hover their hands over, uh, over the game, then the avatar's hands actually move in the same way. How would you suggest to the user that they actually could jump up and grasp uh, and lace their fingers into this mesh? That would just be one, one example. Okay, here's another example. Maybe you put a trampoline, which is a deformable object, uh, into the virtual world, and you put steps leading up to it. And the steps, any kind of stairs or steps or doors, obviously have very powerful uh, affordances that are hard to ignore or um, hard to misinterpret. If there are objects dropping onto the trampoline and steps going up to the trampoline, for most people that would suggest, if they're in an avatar, that the avatar can play in the trampoline, which means the avatar probably has weight and mass and inertia. The user might not be able to articulate that to you, but that's probably what is indirectly suggested to them. Okay, here's some other examples. I'll give you uh, a minute or two to think about this. And as you start to have ideas, just go ahead and type them into, into chat. And again, and this is sort of a, just a brainstorming exercise. There's no wrong answers here. So what, what kind of objects would you create? How would you place them in the world to project affordances? And how would you, how would you place them in the world to project the correct affordances to your users? If you have any ideas, just go ahead and type them into chat. A good way to think about this is what... <laughs> Again, uh, maybe not now during a, the pandemic, but in normal times, you go outdoors. What are all the sorts of activities you, you participate in? How do you exploit your body's interaction with the rich world around you? How do you what kinds of sports and activities uh, uh, afford rich interactions with wind and water flow? Uh, Isaac says, I would demonstrate how an object can be interacted with by showing the player an example that seems natural. Okay, for example, in order to show a player that they can use a weapon to destroy a certain object, I would have an enemy with a similar weapon destroy that kind of object in front of them in a way that seems realistic. Absolutely. So humans are social creatures. You could uh, demonstrate an affordance through interaction. Uh, the avatar, the user sees another avatar pick up or manipulate an object and use it appropriately. That's fine, but of course that requires a lot of scripting in the game. If you're a very clever HCI designer, the very f you often don't need to demonstrate by uh, imitation, right? In the case of the trampoline here, by putting some steps nearby and an object with a mass that is visibly deforming the surface of the trampoline, I guess you could count that as a demonstration. 
You can often suggest or project affordances with less, uh, less work on, the, on behalf of the developer. Uh, Nolan says you could have water flowing through the world with things floating and flowing with it to suggest the interaction with the movement of the water, right? So wind and water simulation is very difficult. It's very computationally expensive. So it's often um, rendered beforehand or there's a lot of computer graphics tricks to present uh, realistic fluid or airflow, but usually the avatar doesn't interact with it. Uh, with advances in GPU simulation, it may become possible to actually interact with that. So this idea of Nolan's of allowing objects to float or flow in the water, and if the avatar knows that they can interact with those objects, the, the user should be able to put two and two together and realize that they can interact or, or be influenced by uh, the water flow. Uh, uh, Nolan continues, says, reaching a hand into the water would move the hand in the direction of the flow. Exa exactly. That would immediately suggest to the user that their body can be influenced by fluid flow, which should immediately bring to mind other possibilities. I wonder if I can swim or sail or dive uh, or row uh, in, this, in this game. Okay. Okay, I think we will pause there. I think you get the idea. So we're looking at particular affordances here, which are, again, suggesting ways that a human can interact with the technology, or in the case of video games or virtual reality, how their avatar's body can push against the virtual world and observe how the world pushes back. We will revisit this issue of virtual reality and the, the, opportun the HCI opportunities implicit in it uh, when we get to lecture 24. For now, we're going to push on uh, to lecture 22, and we're going to talk now not about robots, but social robots, robots that are interacting in real time with human beings. Just as a reminder, we have a robot that takes as input uh, sensation and then acts uh, on the world, and a person may observe or receive a sensory input the robot's behavior. The person is observing the robot and builds up a mental model of what the robot is doing. What is the robot doing? Well, it is doing something similar to what we do, which is performing actions. Those actions alter the environment somehow, and they often alter the interaction between the robot and the environment. And that interaction usually is registered by the sensors of, of the robot, right? So both robots and humans, push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. What happens when we now have a robot that is interacting directly with the human? The output of the robot becomes input to the, per to the, hu to the person and the uh, output of the person becomes input to the robot. We have a social interaction now going on between the robot R and the human H simultaneously as the robot and the human are also interacting or being in influenced by their physical environment. So social interaction is not just about the other person or the human or the robot. It is also about local context. Where are Where is the robot and human situated? What is nearby? And so on. Okay, so in order to structure this lecture on social robots, we're going to think about the various social building blocks that we make use of when we interact with other human beings. Remember our discussion back at the beginning of this course where we were trying to create interactive technologies that support people's social uh, expectations. If they're interacting with another person, they have certain, uh, there's certain social building blocks that both interlocutors or both speakers are uh, making use of. And if the person is interacting with the technology and that technology is talking back or entering into a conversation, either literally or metaphorically with the human user, that interaction should have a lot of the same properties as a social interaction with another person. That makes things easier on the person. We want to do the same thing with, uh, with the robot. If someone is talking to or interacting with the robot, we would expect that robot to engage in that social interaction as much as it's able to in the same way that another human would enter into that social engagement. 
We're going to look at four different social building blocks today, starting with some pretty fundamental ones and working up to some more uh, uh, sophisticated social building blocks. There are many, many social building blocks that we're not going to get to today. What are some of the various uh, social building blocks that are important for social interaction? We are engaged in a social interaction right now, and unfortunately, through uh, Teams, a lot of those social building blocks are missing, which for better or for worse makes, makes exchange here a little bit more difficult than it would in the classroom. We're going without certain social building blocks in our, class, in our class engagements this semester. What are those social building blocks? If you have an idea, go ahead and type it into chat. Physical presence is one, absolutely. That's, that's the main one. What social building blocks are immediately available when all of us are co-located in a classroom together? And what building blocks are missing in this particular form of interaction? Absolutely. Body language and nonverbal cues from students, especially. So there are 24 of you on the call uh, at the moment. I have absolutely no idea how many of the 24 of you are actually paying attention to this lecture. There are no clues here that I can draw on to know. I know that Khan and Bryce are engaged. At least two people are. Hard to, hard to know, right? Let's remember our discussion just now about uh, our, our discussion about situatedness and embodiedness. What are what is the body language and nonverbal cues that you give when you're in a classroom, whether you're aware of it or not, that signal that you're engaged or you're following along with the instructor? What what is the instructor looking for to know whether you're engaged or not? How do I know if we're in a classroom? Reactions to messages, messages in chat. So absolutely, I, that's basically our only tool at the moment that I can rely on. Those are verbal cues, however. You are actually typing in language. As Bryce mentioned, there are many, many nonverbal cues that signal uh, engagement. Confused versus neutral face, right? We spent a lot of time talking when we... Uh, when we talked about affective computing and affect and emotion, facial expression gives a lot of information about whether you're engaged or not. A savvy student will know how to project uh, a facial expression that they're engaged and interested in listening while they're thinking about what they're going to do that night. So that's fine. What are some of the other nonverbal cues? Eye contact, right? So that is clearly missing at the moment. It's hard for me to maintain eye contact with you. I can do it if I'm paying attention, but you are clearly not uh, maintaining eye contact with me, which again makes it harder for me to know whether you're engaged or not. What are some other what are some other nonverbal cues? Think about let's let's forget the classroom for a moment. Imagine you're just chatting with your friend on Zoom. You both have your videos turned on or you're both chatting in person. What are, the, what are the cues that are going on during a social conversation that give you hints about the, um, the state of mind of the interlocutor, the person you're speaking with? How do you know whether they're interested in what you have to say or not? Vocal tone, so we talked about prosody, the way that they speak, body posture, absolutely. Leaning forward if interested, where their eyes are pointed. So usually two people that are engaged are actually looking at one another. However, they may be looking at other things out in the environment. We already talked about joint attention. 
If we were in the classroom, often I'm looking out at you, the students, and talking to you, and from time to time I will look at the screen where I'm projecting the slide, and most of the time, hopefully, if you're engaged, your eyes will follow me to a particular uh, place on the, on the slide, right? Okay, there are hundreds and hundreds of social building blocks. Some of them are less obvious than others. So let's start with uh, let's start with a very simple one, and this is one that was implemented in one of the first uh, uh, humanoid robots. This is Cog. Um, Cog is kind of the parent of BabyBot. BabyBot came after uh, Cog. Uh, it was developed during the 1990s at MIT's uh, AI lab, and the idea behind developing a humanoid robot was that people are more likely or willing to engage with the robot if it's in a human form. There are some people that would argue with that, and they would say that Cog and a lot of other and a lot of other uh, humanoid robots fall in what's known as the uncanny valley. So things that look like humans but are not quite humans um, tend to often provoke a visceral response of repugnance or revulsion. That's uh, part of the reason why people love zombie movies. Zombies are kind of like humans but not quite humans. Same thing with with Cog. Regardless, uh, you can imagine for a lot of situations, uh, as robotics technology improves, for some people it might be more acceptable to interact with a human-shaped robot than a robot shaped in some other uh, ways. Okay, uh, you can Google uh, COG MIT AI Lab. There's a lot of great videos and, and history on, on COG if you're interested in the early days of autonomous uh, robotics. Okay. One of the very first capabilities that was built into COG is VOR, or the vestibular ocular uh, reflex. Vestibular is related to, uh, can be body orientation, but in this case it's orientation of the, of the head. Your inner ear is your vestibular sense, which tells you how your head is oriented uh, relative to, to gravity. Ocular relating to the eyes. So the vestibular ocular reflex in humans is that typically if you're looking at something and your head is moving, your eyes are rotating in opposition to your head. Okay, so this is sort of how do you keep focused on another person so that other object is another person if you are moving. Very simple way to do this is the VOR. So assuming the eyes have found, have locked on to a person or another object in the robot's visual field, if the robot is moving about and its head is moving, it simply moves its eyes in the opposite direction to the head. COG had gyroscopes in its head to detect head motion and the cameras which make up its eyes would rotate in the opposite uh, direction, which would allow it to keep focused on another person. So as we're talking or doing something and I'm gesturing to something and looking and looking back, I want to keep focused on your, your face. This was something that was built uh, into COG. Um, I had a friend who uh, worked on COGS and COG in the early 1990s, and as they were working, building on the vestibular, uh, working on VOR, it hadn't quite, they hadn't worked out the bugs yet but they at least uh, got to the point where the eyes were rotating towards uh, any detected motion in the robot's field of view. My friend was uh, working alone late at night uh, at the MIT AI lab and was, was working in the lab and COG was sitting off in the corner. My friend was coding and paying attention to, to what he was doing on the computer. But every once in a while he would, he would sit up from his, uh, from his coding and COG would immediately look over at him and then slowly look away again. You can imagine my friend didn't spend many more late nights uh, in the lab. Okay. All right, so that's VOR. Um, VOR is great, but how do you keep focused on another person if it's the other person that's moving rather than you moving your own head? Well, we need to obviously be able, or COG or any robot needs to be able to recognize faces. <laughs> Um, developmental psychology, again, the study of children. What are, what are some of the most fascinating objects to babies? What are the things that babies most tend to look at? Um, even before they can speak or reach or grasp or hold, they look for faces, human faces, the faces of their pets, for very good reason. Uh, humans have evolved to be very responsive to faces. Okay, 
So uh, in order, so it's obviously very important to be able to locate faces in my field of view. Um, but this is a tricky thing to do because, of course, uh, faces appear in all different shapes and sizes uh, and orientations. And <laughs> unlike lots of other objects out there in the world, you uh, you can't usually reach out and grab uh, faces and, and manipulate them. Um, there are notable exceptions. Of course, mom and dad will allow a young child to grab their face. So potentially humans tend to learn about faces by physically touching them and manipulating them. But very quickly that becomes uh, verboten and we need to learn about faces visually. Okay, so how do we recognize faces in our visual field? We've seen a few optical illusions so far. Here's yet another one down here. This optical illusion is giving you a hint about how we recognize faces. What is that hint? This optical illusion should remind you of another illusion we've talked about already. It has a similar property. Most people find it hard to look at this optical illusion for very long. It makes you feel kind of dizzy or it makes you feel like your eyes are unfocused. Why? What's happening? What other illusion that we've already seen does this remind you of? No? So this is the facial uh, analog of the Necker cube. One way that we recognize uh, faces is our, our eyes are immediately drawn to things that look like other eyes and we tend to focus eyes and if we see a pair of eyes that's promising it suggests maybe we're looking at a face. We focus a pair of eyes in the center of our visual field and then our brain generates a mental model a hypothesis that perhaps we're looking at a human face. In order to verify that hypothesis, our eyes jump and saccade and should land about here. But there is no, there's, when, the, when your eyes jump to exactly this point, you do not see lips at this point. There are lips on, uh, in either direction. So you're, again, like the Necker cube, the prediction that if you jump from these eyes about two centimeters down, you should see lips at those position is almost met but not quite so your brain updates a little bit locks on to the upper or the lower pair of lips which suggests to your brain aha maybe i'm looking at a face if i am i should be able to jump two centimeters up and see a pair of eyes but i don't i see four eyes nearby and if you pay attention if you relax and just again look at this face You'll often feel that your eyes are saccading rapidly up and down uh, quickly, which is what gives you the feeling that you're get, your, uh, your, your vision is blurry or you're getting dizzy or it, it's tiring to look at this image. Okay. Okay, so we want to try and create robots that are able to recognize faces. Um, again, this was an open problem in AI for a long time. It's now been solved thanks to the deep learning revolution. We can train a neural network. If we give it a million images that contain a face and another million images that do not contain a face, we can train a neural network to, uh, to recognize faces and images. I'm going to show you an example uh, from 1998. This was before the deep learning revolution. Um, and so in this case, uh, uh, Professor Scazzaletti at, at Yale came up with a simple heuristic, a relatively simple algorithm that he built into COG that allowed COG to recognize faces. And it goes as follows. Um, at, at every point in time, COG is receiving pairs of images from its two cameras. We're not going to worry about stereo uh, vision for now. We'll just assume we have a single image, like the one that you see here. 
COG performs image segmentation. It looks for blotches of a relatively uniform color that are different from the rest of the color in the image. So if we see a blotch of relatively uniform color, maybe that blotch is a face, maybe that blotch is a cup, uh, a plate, uh, a clock on the wall. We don't know whether it's a face or not. So we're going to put a bounding box shown in blue around that blob. And then inside that bounding box, we're going to cut it into a series of rectangles. You can see here that are placed at particular positions. Within each rectangle, we're going to throw away all the color information and convert each of the pixels to grayscale, so the brightness or darkness of the pixels. We're then going to take the average light level in each uh, rectangle, which is going to give us 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 rectangles, 16 numbers, which is the average grayscale in each of these 16 boxes. One of the defining things, uh, one of the, the defining things about faces, uh, Joseph says, did this take into account binocular parallax so that there aren't false positives on, for example, photos? Very good, very good point. Unless you use binocular parallax, it's impossible for COG to distinguish between whether it's looking at a face or looking at a photograph of a face. Good catch, Joseph. COG cannot distinguish between faces or photographs of faces. Okay, so uh, we're, we're taking the average grayscale in these uh, images, and then as the name of this algorithm implies, the name of the algorithm is ratio templates, we're going to look at the ratio or the relative light levels or the relative grayscales between pairs of rectangles. What we're going to uh, what we're going to look for are certain. We're going to look at certain neighboring uh, neighbors of uh, neighboring um, rectangles represented by the arrows, and we're looking for certain uh, certain differences. So, for example, these two boxes, which should have captured the eyes if there actually is a face within this bounding box. Um, these eyes should, in general, be darker than the rest of the face. If you look at all, look at these three very different faces. In all three cases, the eyes are significantly darker than the rest of the face. Um, the arrow that's pointing in to a box. So, for example, this arrow here represents that this box. The head of the arrow represents that this box should be darker than this box. We're going to give one point. We're going to visit each of these uh, arrows, and if and if the ratio is correct, meaning that this rectangle actually is darker than this rectangle, we're going to give one point in favor of the hypothesis that this bounding box has actually captured uh, a face. If instead this box is lighter than this box, we subtract a point. If there is no significant difference in the light levels between these two boxes, we neither award a point or take away a point. Through a lot of uh, a lot of sort of just playing around with this algorithm and sort of just uh, some user testing, they found that if they visited all of these arrows and uh, in a, for a particular if a particular bounding box scored more than 11 points, that usually meant the bounding box had captured a face and not a plate or a can or a cup or a sheet of paper or something else. Okay. Why why are they looking at uh, why are they looking at ratios darker than lighter than rather than looking uh, at absolute light levels, absolute brightness values? Everything in the ratio template is about relative values rather than absolute values. Why? Lighting differences, so you can probably see on the screen at the moment, there's more light falling on this side of my face than on this side of my face. Of course, we want to be able to recognize faces uh, in all different kinds of lighting conditions. But it's not just lighting that the designer of the ratio template algorithm took into account. What other context about faces matters here? Remember our packed analysis. We're creating an interactive technology here. 
a robot that can recognize human faces, what context is being brought into account. Physical context like lighting is part of it, but not all of it. Skin color, exactly. The designers of this algorithm obviously uh, were sensitive to the fact that faces come in lots of different shapes and sizes and also shades. So one of the nice things about the ratio template is that it's uh, race agnostic. It will work uh, for people with uh, various, uh, for a very diverse uh, skin tone. Okay. So again, this is from 1998. I apologize for the quality of this uh, video. You can see uh, Professor Scazzoletti here demonstrating his algorithm. You can see the raw video feed on the right and the results of the ratio template algorithm on the left. The ratio template algorithm does not label plates, moving plates as faces, only faces as faces. But as Joseph mentioned, uh, if we held up uh, a photograph of a face and did the same thing, we would get a false positive. The ratio template would say this is actually a face or would not at least would not be able to distinguish between faces and pictures of faces. Okay, so that's obviously important, recognizing faces, but of course in social interactions the important thing is not, uh, the, the only, uh, the important thing is not just faces, but there may be some common object or objects in the environment that the person who's speaking uh, is interested in and would also like to draw your attention to. We've already talked about joint attention once. Now we're going to look at joint attention and try and build this into uh, a robot. And uh, here's the actual full paper for those of you that are interested in the technical details. Again, we're going to just go over uh, go over this very briefly. Basic idea in joint attention is not only am I looking, at, not only am I trying to recognize and keep focused on human faces, I'm also going to infer gaze direction by looking at the uh, pupils and the rest of the whites of the eye. Okay. So how does this work? Uh, in this case, the researchers used a much simpler robot. This is not a humanoid robot. It had basically just this immovable base. And it had what's known as an active vision system, which means it's able to move the pairs of cameras together. It was able to either uh, tilt, it was uh, sorry, either to, able to tilt the pair of uh, cameras up and down, which I'm gonna represent as theta uh, tilt and pan both cameras left and right. So swivel this base here. So we've got basically these two numbers. So the robot, although it can't, it's sort of minimally embodied, it can't really impact its world very much. It can at least move its own, its own head and look at different things in its visual field. Okay, so the algorithm that they built into this robot starts by focusing the cameras or the robot moves its head so that it centers a caregiver's face in the middle, in the center of its field of view. It uses something similar to the ratio template algorithm to find faces in the environment and center on them, focus on them. When it does, um, the robot might recognize uh, other objects in the uh, might recognize other objects in its field of view. So forget about what the human is doing at the moment. What, from the robot's point of view, it sees a human face in the center, and it sees another object bottom right. At another point in time, the robot sees again a human face in the center of its field of view, and it sees a second object bottom right. A first a one object bottom right and a second object top left. The robot can then ask the question, which of these two objects, if either of these two objects, is the, ro is the human looking at? For us, of course, it's trivial. You can see immediately that the human is looking at the lower right object. But remember that thinking about thinking is misleading. It is not so obvious for the robot to know is to extract features from the human face to know what object the human is looking at. Okay, so the robot starts by focusing on the caregiver's face and then the, uh, the machine learning algorithm that's running inside the robot decides at the beginning at random to move the camera to focus on one uh, of the objects that are also in its field of view. So 
for example, uh, the robot may choose uh, uh, may choose to look at this object. Uh, sorry, the robot may choose to move and look at this object just by chance. There are two objects in the robot's field of view. Maybe the robot flips a coin. Heads, it looks at this object. Tails, it looks at this object. Tails, it comes up tails, so the robot moves, it pans and tilts the camera until this object is in the center of its field of view. It gets feedback from the caregiver, from the human trainer, who says, good job, you actually looked at the object that I was looking at, and there is no change that is made to the machine learning algorithm. If instead the robot looked at the human face and then saccaded to this object over here, the caregiver would say you looked at the wrong object and the machine learning algorithm would change the connections in the learning module. It would update uh, the machine learning algorithm it's using so that next time it might do something differently like look at the correct object. We'll finish talking about uh, jo this joint attention algorithm next time. Uh, you have a quiz due tonight. You're working on interim video one. Have a good rest of your day, and I'll see you all back here uh, on Thursday. Thanks very much. Bye-bye.